Thank you very much for coming. I'm sorry there aren't quite enough chairs for everybody, but I'm really pleased to see a full room full of people. Um, my name is Paul Belford. I'm director of the Crew Paris Archaeological Trust. Um, my colleagues, Jess Spencer and Viviana, here are responsible for organising this event, so many thanks to them for doing that. Um, Viviana will be filming proceedings, so I'm very grateful to all the speakers who agreed to do that, and we'll put that up on, on the website at some future point. So here we are at Bodleworth and Castle uh, to talk about the archaeology of military training and warfare, trench warfare specifically, trench warfare in Wales, and, trench, and the trench warfare experience of the Welsh, really. Um, and I'm very grateful, actually, I must say, to Kevin Mason and his colleagues at the Bodleworth and Castle Trust for uh, facilitating us being here today. <coughs> we have a number of books uh, on the side there for sale, um, which you can have a look at later. There's a display in the corridor which you've seen coming up from uh, T, uh, which has some information about the work we've done. We've done CKT on this subject. Um, and you've all now, I think, found where the T and the toilets are, I hope. Um, I'm not going to do the sort of fire alarm, fire escape, emergency things. Um, so here we are talking about um, the archaeology of uh, trench warfare uh, with very much a Welsh focus and uh, at this point uh, just discuss some of the work that we at CPAT and uh, our colleagues in the other Welsh archaeological trust have been doing which is part of a four year programme of looking at the archaeology of the Great War um, funded by, by CADU and it sits alongside work being done in England and elsewhere in Europe and it's not just about Welsh or British, but it's about everyone really who's involved in, in trench warfare uh, during this period. Um, so today is, uh, as it says here, the 12th of March 2016. Um, just to give a bit of context, I thought I might uh, ramble on a little bit about what was happening 100 years ago today on the 12th of March 1916. Well, three weeks ago, the Battle of Verdun had begun. It was to last until Christmas. So if you can imagine for a moment that you're all going to be in this room until Christmas, and by Christmas half of you will be dead, then that is the Battle of the Dark. Um, already today, three weeks into the Battle of the Dark, about 45,000 French and German <coughs> men have been killed or seriously injured. And to put that in perspective, in 2011, the census for Denbyshire male population of Denbyshire was 45,987. By the end of the Battle of Verdun, about 300,000 men have been killed on both sides, which is more than three times the entire modern population of Denbyshire. A total of nearly 800,000 casualties, which is about two-thirds the present-day male population of the whole of Wales. Of course, Verdun was not the only battle that was going to happen in 1916. Uh, in about three months' time, the Battle of the Somme began, and this resulted in over a million casualties on both sides, including over 300,000 deaths. Um, there's the Battle of Verdun. The lines uh, at the beginning of the German offensive, uh, which the French uh, retained uh, their positions, and at the end of the battle, uh, the lines were the much better than they are now. Uh, there's the main front, there's the Battle of Verdun, there's the Battle of the Somme. Uh, and again, at the end of this uh, bloody year, 1916, that line didn't move very much. And again, here in northwestern Europe, we tend to focus very much on the Western Front, um, which is this. But of course, the Great War was a world war, with Eastern, Russian, and Southern Front too. <coughs> so what else was going on on this day, 12th of March, 1916? On the southern front, we were halfway through a 10 day battle at the river of Lissonzo. And there are in fact 11 battles uh, since last summer and until next September. Um, and it's an Italian push to invade the Austro Hungarian Empire, largely as a distraction uh, for the central powers away from what's going on on the western front and in Russia. The fifth battle, of which we're in the middle of about a week's battle, cost about 4,000 lives on both sides and made no real significant difference to the outcome of the war. Meanwhile, the British and their allies were busy on the eastern flank of the Ottoman Empire. On this day, a hundred years ago, in a dusty square in Basra, the command of the uh, eastern divisions were handed over from Lieutenant General Elmer 
2, Lieutenant General Gorringe. These troops included Muslim, Hindu and Sikh regiments from what is now Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, India, Sub-Saharan Africa, Pakistan and Bangladesh. And they launched a series of assaults on the eastern flank of the Ottoman Empire. And during the course of the few months that that took place, uh, approximately 100,000 men died. So that's the entire population of Denver are killed in the space of a few months. Of course, there are other serious activity as well. Uh, 20,000 men died in March 1916 in Asia and Russia and elsewhere. And there was, of course, conflict at sea yesterday. A British destroyer was sunk in the North Sea. Today, another British ship was sunk in the Black Sea. Tomorrow, another British destroyer was sunk in the North Sea. So in 1916 alone, there were about one and a half million killed or injured as a direct result of conflict. And that's about half the entire population of Wales today. That's 16 times the modern population of Denver. I think it's important that we remember these facts. All of these men had to be trained to kill and to be killed, and that's really why we're here today. Um, Kinmore Park Camp in Bobby Widden was one of the largest trench warfare training areas ever devised. Most of the troops that came here were Canadian, and just to remember that 65,000 Canadians died during the course of the First World War. Among them was uh, chap David Milne, uh, who was an artist, and he came here towards the end of the war and painted some very uh, beautiful paintings of life in the camp. We see here uh, dinner is served, a rather industrial scale uh, dinner, as one would imagine, if you're fighting an industrial war. Um, and these serve as a record, they're now in the National uh, Gallery of Canada, um, serve as a, a really uh, intimate record of the lives of the men that were here. Um, and here we have Private Brown writing a Christmas letter home on 25th of December 1918. Um, and writing home, of course, a very important part uh, of the troops' experience, I suppose, both in training and uh, on the front. And one of the more famous uh, people to pass through this building uh, was Robert Graves, the war poet, um, who was suffering from shell shock in 1915 and found his way here <coughs> and commandant by 1917. Um, he seemed to have enjoyed his time as camp commandant rather more than he did his time in the trenches, I think it's fair to say. Um, but he wrote about this camp in his memoirs and of course he wrote a number of poems about uh, his experience in the trenches. And so that brings us really to the title of our uh, day today. And I'll, which comes from a poem by Robert Graves called 1915, which I shall read. I've watched the seasons passing slow, so slow, in the fields between La Basse and Bethune. Primroses and the first warm day of spring, red poppy floods of June, August and yellowing autumn. So to winter nights, knee deep in mud or snow, and you've been everything. Dear, you've been everything that I most lack in these soul deadening trenches. Pictures, books, music, the quiet of an English wood, beautiful comrade looks, the narrow, bouldered mountain track, the broad, full bosomed ocean, green and black, and peace and all that's good. So, we will begin by uh, Martin Brack, who's going to, from WIG, who's going to give us a more of the background, I think, to the broad training program. Uh, Oh, yeah. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, what I am going to do is probably step on Roger's toes a little bit. Um, I'll just put somebody else's up and do that one. It'd be far more interesting. Um, and give you a bit of an overview of Great War training and talk about then training into practice um, from some work um, at Plug Street in Belgium and uh, I'm not doing now. now this will be for sale later at 10 earth pounds um, and you can get both the authors to sign and really reduce the resale <laughs> um, in 1999 I went looking for a set of practice trenches of Polgate, just north of Eastbourne in East Sussex. 
I was the first person to have gone doing archaeological research and investigations into such things, apart from um, Royal Commission documenting them on Salisbury Plain places. Um, at that point, everybody basically said, why are you doing that? All the interesting stuff's over the channel. And I said, no, 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 because this is important. It's really nice to see that um, I was right, and I wasn't actually barking up the wrong tree. Um, so, uh, the Polgate trenches don't appear today because uh, having gone and looked for them, we discovered that the 1975 Polgate bypass works had actually um, either destroyed or buried them under such an amount of earth that uh, they were uh, they weren't there to be found. So, anyway, um, there we are. So, the the war <coughs> left an enormous physical legacy, um, as, as 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 we know here: landscape, archaeology, individual artifacts. Um, and I'm going to look at uh, the conflict landscape as meaningful artifact, and just look at some case studies, and we'll go landscape and people, because it's all about people at the end, as, as Paul just, just showed by talking about uh, all the... You know, I've never heard the population of Flinch. Everybody's used to the size of whales as an indicator, but actually, I like that. That's, um, so, why look at it archaeologically? Because it doesn't get written about very much otherwise. If you've read Sassoon and Graves and Owen and all those people, um, they talk about what happens when it gets unpleasant and there are Germans over the other side of the field rather than cows. The ordinary reader wants to read about the exciting stuff and the soldiers who are reading about it, they probably want to read about his experiences that were different rather than the commonality of we all went and we lived in huts and we, we dug trenches and we marched about. And, you know, Blunden talks about going to the bull ring in, um, at Etapel for his, when he gets off the boat, but not much more than that. So there is a gap in the record, uh, in, 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 the, in the sort of the popular story of the Great War. Um, and the archaeology, largely apart from my initial foray, uh, has gone and looked at the sharp end because that's exciting and it's where people can get the immediate emotional contact. But really, if we're going to understand what happens at the sharp end, we have to understand what happens here. And if we want to understand the archaeological landscape um, of a place like this, then we need to understand what those strange lumps and bumps are, as well as all the other strange lumps and bumps that might be out in those fields. I think, I can't remember whether I put it in, but you know, having just done some survey work uh, to look at two very nice Bronze Age barrows, um, which had literally as the barrows were here at the distance of where the other side of the room is there were practice trenches falling off down the hill so um, it's, it's part of the landscape story as well um, let's go back to 1978 De Dennis Winter's Death Men uh, this, was, this was his uh, rather dismissive summary of Great War training um, an air of unreality but hang on to that idea um, based on tactical concepts obsolete at the time of the Boer War. You might want to think about that one. And I particularly like this one. Our, our soldiers, until the last year of the war, continued to be trained as blockishly as had been Wellington's men. And I will come back to that one as well. Um, so just, you know, that our, our view of the war um, by our I mean, society is not, not, a, not an audience which is thinking about it. Uh, is still more or less shaped by the 1970s view of futility, um, botch, and, um, and general chaos in uniform with mass, mass, mass casualties because we can. Um, so that, that's probably if we went and stopped someone randomly out in the, uh, in the park today and asked them about first world water and they'd probably still say, did they? And give us some sort of view a bit like that. Uh, however, uh, the Vitesius <coughs> Um, writing a few, a few years before the First World War, uh, did point out, and this would have been known to people like Haig, that um, only skill and discipline ensure victory, and that if you send undisciplined troops to uh, battle, you are basically committing mass murder. And uh, there's some Romans training, and uh, there's somebody more recently training. You can tell he's training because he's got a blue, blue training grenade. So... 1914, British Army is more or less the size it is today. It's spread around the globe, doing colonial policing and, uh, and yeah, basically maintaining a global empire, and it's all good. And then the First World War happens, um, and 
it's a, it's a, bit, a bit of a slightly different problem uh, to what they're anticipating. You have to integrate the Commonwealth troops from Indian subcontinent, Canada, as we've heard, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, you have to build your new army from all these hundreds of recruits who are all rushing to the colours. Uh, you have to retrain the reservists who've turned up because what they were doing was very, very different. Um, and as the war continues, you respond to the situation as it develops, the learning curve. New weapons, new tactics, new landscapes, um, new technology. Everything's moving very, very quickly. It's, it's no surprise, I'm sure Roger will touch on this, but over the course of 14 to 15, there are all sorts of books, some officially published as manuals, some unofficially published, that are coming out saying the situation is changing, trying to keep up, trying to keep up. Um, the ultimate end objective of this, of course, the aim is winning the war. Um, so, uh, there we are. That's, that's, that, that, that's the problem, if you see what I mean. Um, uh, everybody goes, ooh, that's a great idea. So, practice trenches. What are they for? Um, they have many, many meanings and many uses. One simple one is to build fitness. Yes, people who rush to the colours in 14 are miners and dockers and steel workers and the rough, tough, hard blokes who can do a half day's labour. And then an awful lot of them work in offices and shipping clerks and work for, for the railways and people like that. And they're no fitter than, you know, the, the average 17 year old today. So um, you've got to build fitness. You have to develop unit cohesion. And yes, pals battalions are great for everybody being mates but you want everybody to work together in that military sense. They teach people how to dig, build and maintain trenches. And actually, once that trench line is set, that line that was on Paul's photograph that goes all the way from the, the, border, to, the border of Switzerland to the coast, digging new trenches is, isn't a huge amount of work. Maintaining them is, my goodness. And anyone who's seen any of the um, replica sets, um, that are around will know that maintenance is the problem. Uh, you build them and they look gorgeous, and then within three weeks they all look really scabby and horrible. So trench maintenance, and that's with, that's with weather and tourists, without trench mortars and uh, German attention. Uh, you can use them for combat training, touch on that. Uh, you can use them for teaching people to live in the trenches. Because, you know, my granddad lived in two up two down in Hull, and suddenly, he has to live in a hole in Belgium. And it's not a nice hobbit hole. Um, you can use them for pre-deployment battle hardening. And I, I will touch on this. I've got one example of this. And you can teach them. You can make the, sim the simulacrum of the battlefield, the replica battlefield, for what we would now call mission-specific training. And they can be very, very specialist in their function and nature. So there we are. There's a, there's a, there's a really, that's, yes practice attacking over trenches. It looks really it looks really silly, but actually you've got to build people's confidence to jump over a six foot deep hole um, whilst carrying a bayonet and not fall over and spat themselves and all that sort of thing. It's, it's, it's good useful stuff. But this is 14 training. Hard caps, out on Salisbury playing this one um, with uh, what looks like possibly some very poor condition archaeology in the background. Um, practicing field firing, yes, practicing for the Boer War uh, the war previous, but that's not, that's over trenches. The British Army had not put the books away in 1901 at the end of the Boer War and thought, well, that's what will happen next. They had observers in the Russo-Japanese War and seen that trench warfare was immensely significant. So, um, it all gets a bit more serious. Now, this is a, a, a lovely image because these are training trenches and at the same time they are not because this is Surrey Heath and it's part of the London Defence Ring. So those guys are Inns of Court uh, officer cadets and they are learning how to build and maintain trenches, so they are training, but they are also building defensive works around London so that if by some chance the Germans invade, and there is a, a, a real worry of this, um, then that is what is going to defend the capital. There are Sailors digging trenches. Royal Naval Division. Um, that's Blandford Camp in uh, Dorset, where the Royal Signals are based now. And um, not only are they trenching there, they're also tunnelling because uh, parts of the car park 
works collapsed. Um, a few years ago, I got a very, rather panicky call from the archaeological contractor there saying, uh, uh, we've just had a hole developed and it's, it's fallen through into a big chamber underneath those traces that you told us to look out for. <laughs> so that's nice. Um, yeah, we knew that, so we sort of think the Royal Engineers are doing it in various places, but this is, this is somebody else doing it, which is good. Um, I particularly like the, um, the early war element of this with the sheep pens still out on the dam and it's all still a bit, you know training area and the, the sheep are still doing their thing and it's um it's all a bit ad hoc <coughs> and then you'll see a lot more of this but there's the full glory of a three-line system with defended villages and redoubts and the, the whole lot and dugouts and saps and so roger's going to talk about that so i won't <coughs> steal his thunder and you get them all over the place from scotland to the deserts of us uh, of uh, of Egypt with Australians, a total global world war there, I love that, that image. Um, it's, not a, it's not a decolorized still from Gallipoli, that's real. Um, and that, as you know, because most of you wandered over here or worked on the project, that's the sort of thing that you find. Um, the sinuous earthworks trailing across the landscape, but when you first fall across them you think, What's going on here? And you get out into the scrub and start to find the communication trenches in the second and third line and how the, the landscape has been shaped and whether those trenches are actually using the terrain. Uh, a lovely system had by Marlow in uh, Buckinghamshire, early war, and whoever laid those in had obviously either done it for real in France and come back or had thought about it really carefully because they're just beautiful views across the valley, defence in depth so that if an attacker got up onto the hill crest and breached that first line of trenches. They've then got, as the ground falls away on the dip slope, they're skylined, they can take, they'll take a lot of fire and they've got to fight through and through and through. It's really, really well positioned. Um, these are on Beacon Hill on Salisbury Plain. The field of view there is as good as anything. You know, if you've been up on the top of the Vimy Ridge, you think, oh, that's why the Germans wanted this. And it's that same sort of commanding view. Um, yeah. And weirdly, you find training trenches near the front line. Uh, this is still from the famous Battle of the Somme film by Geoffrey Malins, but of course, Alistair um, Fraser's work um, for the Ghosts of the Somme book showed that this is filmed at a training ground behind the line. Uh, you see these same bits of barbed wire from different angles. You see men who are injured, uh, and then look back to the camera and go, oh, was that what you wanted? Um, <laughs> they, and, and famously, the trench mortar with the man's shoes <coughs> or boots in the back of shot as he's standing there in what would have been a really dangerous position had he been <laughs> much nearer the Germans. <laughs> so training, training sites may be found much closer to the battlefield, um, meaning you would have heard the real war going on at the same time as you were practicing. And you have specific functions for your trenches. Um, these are Otterburn, Northumberland. You might have seen uh, uh, Robson Green with a uh, friend, both Madden Richards, Phil Abramson, talking about these on his TV series. Um, they're beautiful. They're, the quality of work here is absolutely as it should be by the manual, with uh, revetting posts and re re restraining wires and uh, trench boards still remarkably, uh, weirdly surviving very, very well. Um, the gutter at the bottom, the only bit where I, I love this, um, somebody's overdug it and that's the archaeology of training not going quite right and if you listen very carefully you could still hear them being bowled out nearly 90 years old um, and uh, it's fab and it's, it's what a trench should look like <coughs> and there's absolutely no evidence unlike all this lovely stuff that you found there was no evidence of anyone ever using them for anything on the ground because they appear to have built them and have gone away and fired artillery at them. Um, because we found an awful lot of shell splinters and fuse caps. So basically, they spent put an awful lot of work into getting it right and learning how to do it, and then going away and learning how to do the other job, because this is, Reedsdale Camp is uh, artillery training. But um, it's the real thing. And just to show that monuments um, do change over time, this front line had been 
very much adapted. It didn't look First World War at all. Um, I was told it looked a bit more Warsaw Pact, and it had um, base cut into it for pop-up targets for anti-tank training. Uh, another Canadian National Gallery picture. Um, this is within the South Downs National Park, just above um, Cookmere Haven and Seaford Head here, and this is gas training, Canadian troops training uh, for use with chemical weapons. Um, we think we know where these are now. Um, some guys from Sussex Arkansas have been looking for them, and uh, it's, you know, who'd have thought it in the, the at the heart of beautiful rural southeast England, uh, <laughs> letting off nasty, smoky stuff. Uh, this is another, uh, this is um, Burkamp State Common, and it's again, I think, the Inns of Court that's um, taking gas training mostly seriously. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you think, oh yeah, that's because they haven't got the reality of it. Um, Edmund Blunden, of course, famously talks about when they're issued PH shunts. Um, that they put them on because you've got the valve that you put into your mouth and you breathe out through it. At which point, me and um, the other officer ran up and down the trench entertaining the men by making farty noises, which is what a Christ hospital education does for you. Um, he, there is always place for humour in these situations. Um, <coughs> Burkhamstead Common, of course, famously, uh, if you've read Lynn MacDonald's 1915, one of the old boys she interviewed said uh, something along the lines of, I dug more trench, more miles of trenches on Burkhamsted Common than I ever did in France. That's reinforcing my point that you dig them in training and you maintain them when you're really out there, because someone else by and large has done the work already. Uh, and here's some um, Indian uh, troops, or I suppose uh, training, also training for use of, of their, their pea hoods. This is the only circular trench system that we know that's on Portland Down, it is scheduled. Um, the idea here was that if you dug a circular system, no matter which way the wind was blowing, you could practice the release of gas and the clearance of gas from your trenches. Um, they built it and then it doesn't seem quite to have worked, it's been abandoned fairly quickly. And it now looks on the ground like an amazing, another of the amazing prehistoric monuments of, of Salisbury Plain, but it's much, much more recent. 1916 sees the first deployment of the tank, and you need to train, get given this thing, you've got to learn how to use it. Um, driving it in some nice parkland in Suffolk is, is fine, that's, that's good. Uh, what do you do? We've got to drive it across the battlefield, you go to Bovington, to the tin town, and you learn how to do it there. And this is from the Tank Museum Library, magnificent trench map as good as anything that you see for the Western Front. It's one of the few that I've seen that goes to that detail for Britain for home training. Replicating a nod to where Richard's go going later with his, um, his presentation, onto the Hindenburg Line. This is training tanks to break the Hindenburg Line um, from the British. So you've got to learn how to cross your own trenches in that, in that tank. They're there. Uh, you've got to then cross no man's land and get in and amongst those heavily defended German positions and, and work through them, including dealing with trenches and with these redoubts. And everything's named as it's a real trench map, uh, mostly from the loose battlefield, which probably tells us something about the, um, either the officer setting up the system, getting it built, or the mapping officer uh, for where they've done their, their sort of soldiering. Um, if you go to this part of the site, there's nothing to see because it is still used for British tank training. And a hundred years of tanks tends to <laughs> churn the ground up a bit. Um, happily, this is Dorset Wildlife Trust Nature Reserve, Gallows Hill. And this is a shooting school and glider uh, airstrip. Uh, I don't think they do them both at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> And if you walk, certainly, uh, that's all overgrown and heathy, because it's, it's lovely heathland, but you can see traces of some of this. And certainly when you walk along this line, along the, uh, the side of the, the shooting school, there, there are those traverses, very clear. Only about that deep now, but still there to be seen. And machine guns. If, uh, if you haven't seen, I commend to you the Time Team special on the, on the machine gunners at Belton House. 
Um, the camps were there. Immediately adjacent to them was the what's now the golf course with the butts for fixed replica at the front line. You might recognise that one. What I like here is the shell holes. I'm taking in <coughs> digging shell holes. Now I'm fascinated by them because I dug a set. Now let's skip over that one. Dug a set in Belgium with German training trenches. There we are. Bottom of the trench, fire step, revetments, all very nice. Out in no man's land, there were shell holes. Some of them, like this one, have been dug, and you can see how they've actually took the, the spade marks from, from coming in from that side and hiking it out. Some of them have been blown because they have the conical profile and they have bits of trench mortar fuse in the bottom of them. So they're getting troops in, potentially in those trenches, and firing over their heads, or they're training the mortar crews, but if they were, they were they weren't hitting the other side, which is a useful. So I'd be interested to know what yours actually look like. Shane John's not here, I could have twisted his arm and said, go on, give him permission to dig a shell hole. Uh, are they blown? Are they shelled? Or are they dug? And there's some Germans in there, lovely, uh, lovely training trenches. They did it as well. So, a can of chase. Uh, 60,000 men are in two camps. There's one of them. Tolkien's up here. There's some training trenches being dug at the at the, the side of the old the old Acre Valley drops away. There's the camp in the background with its power station with its four chimneys. There's probably better sewage and electricity in there than Brockton Town down below. Um, lots of lovely Birmingham University geophysics. Um, this trench system is particularly interesting because the trenches are about that deep, about that wide, so they're but there's a lovely big platform there, and what I think is going on, it's about the size of a hut. I think you've got indoor classroom, outdoor classroom. And the people are being given, the, as we are doing now, and then the, the, the instructor says, right, gentlemen, outside, and he walks them through this and talks about whatever it is, principles of defence or construction or whatever. Uh, we know that there are lots of practice trenches. You can walk across the chase and you can fall down them. Uh, and there, there's, there are rifle ranges which still survive. And we know there's a grenade range because we have um, this rather lovely postcard sent back from the camp in 1916. Um, and because people very occasionally walk into the Museum of the Black Country, uh, uh, Camp Chase, and say, I found this on the chase, do you want it? It's a Mills bomb, and it all gets a bit interesting. <laughs> um, we did some excavation a few years ago. Um, I think. This is where that photograph was taken. Those strapping chaps with their shirts off were somewhere here, and there is a bit of trench in front of me. Um, that over there is this test pit. Um, so you've got the whole of the valley is militarised, um, and what you've got here is trench with evidence of apparently rebuilding with sandbagging to reinforce the corner where they, because it's bunted bends, it's horrible gravelly sand where the trench walls have been falling away, and they've, they've revetted it and reinforced it. Um, and magnificently, of course, I won't, I won't talk about this any length, but we have our tactical model built by the New Zealanders to train uh, their drafts coming in in 1918. The, there it is, because we excavated it a couple of years ago. That's the, uh, the crossroads in Messine. Right, so, Richard and myself, when we were both working on Salisbury Plain, um, concocted this idea of looking at some training works on Salisbury Plain. Um, and then we did this, we followed the unit that they were connected with into action and saw what was, whether it worked. So that, that's, there's, our, there's our research, uh, uh, you know, the body of our research, uh, outside the Chinese takeaway in my village, in fact. Um, and the kids outside what's now the co-op. And there they are, in their trenches. You think, God, isn't that great? Actually, what's wrong with that picture? Well, it's training trenches because they've got um, the wrong rifle for being at the front. Uh, one of them's still got his bedding roll on. Uh, they're not wearing helmets, and those trenches are awfully shallow um, for being anywhere near anyone who's trying to kill you. Uh, it is Salisbury Plain. Um, but it's a massive system with wire, three lines of defence, communication trenches, use of the forward slope. Um, it's, it's all there. 
that potentially is these trenches uh, at Lark Hill. For any of you who have been in the military, particularly gunners, uh, I've mentioned the word Lark Hill, of course, the shiver to go down your spine, I'm sure. Um, but we've got our trench lines here. That, that's some barrack huts. We've got trenches here and here and here coming down through there. It's more or less, I, I literally very kindly has brought me a decent print out of that image so I can, I can on Monday now go stand and try and work out whether we are in the right place. Um, but those trenches I just showed you are right next to the camp that those boys are in. About a mile and a half north is Half Moon Cops and this set, this is an OGS Crawford Air photograph from post-war. Some of the system is still in use. Some of it's been backfilled, some of it's abandoned. Um, and down here, you've got a big mine crater. Now we know for definite that the Australian 3rd Division troops that I just showed you are training in these trenches because there's their trench map in the Australian War Memorial. Same cops, same system, names on the trenches, little crater out front, and a lot of stuff going on down here. Compare and contrast. And there's some geophysics, there's that crater, and there it is on the geophysics with its T head sap. It's all good. If you look down below the cops, there's a, cr a large crater without works. There's 1916 training in preparation for the Battle of the Sea, which, as you know, is preceded by a massive set of mines going off. And the British, up to that point, had been bad at the Battle of the Crater. You know, they blow craters like the um, Hawthorne Ridge and they are not good at taking and holding them. The Germans consistently beat them to the crater lip. So the Australian troops here are practicing and practicing. <coughs> and this one appears to be blown up in a, in a show, uh, in the full sense of the word, uh, where Monash, as the commander, brings down people from London and says, look what my boys can do. And that's uh, officers' briefing notes. That's what we're going to do. What they actually blow and what they do is slightly different on the ground, but it's near enough. Training, <coughs> theory into training practice. That's just a view over that ground, very flat. So, they go and do it for real. There, at Plug Street. That's part of the Battle of Messine. There's the there's Messine, front line comes down like that on that ground. And the mines, so that's our study area, the mines are blown thus. And we're looking at an area just here, saint or saint as it is now, um, with factory farm moat, defended by the Germans with trench line running through it, British lines coming through here. And a second mine that's going to be blown there. The landscape in early 16. Remarkably undisturbed. There's been a lot of fighting there in 14, and everybody realises it's flat and it's featureless, and you take massive casualties. Let's stop and go and fight somewhere else. So the ground recovery, it, it, it makes good sense. The ground recovers a bit. The Germans are defending more heavily than the British. Um, May 17, the Germans know there's something coming. They've been defending massively and shelling has increased. And then I give you the power of high explosive. Um, yeah, and then yeah, that's, that's what happens when you put a busload of Amatol under a bit of Belgium. Um, that's really important because you can see it's got defensive works around it. Just what they were practicing. There's our geophysics of the same area. That's that crater today. Well, about five years ago, but yeah, you get my drift. Um, those are about meter fence posts. It's a whacking great feature, and because it's got a crater lip, it gives you instant high ground. But when that thing goes off the shockwave from it, devastates trenches, it causes them to collapse. And so here, immediately north of the crater, you've got German trench with collapse on two sides. 
and then it being re-dug and re-revetted with corrugated iron by Australian pioneers. And it doesn't need to be as big and swanky and gucci as the German trench that preceded it, because all you need is a fixed firing position for when the German counter-attack comes in, which they, they always do. In this case, they don't, because they're, pushed, they're knocked back. But in the crater lip, you've got these little crawl saps. Perfect for Lewis guns. This one, um, this one rather nicely was abandoned quite quickly and became a rubbish dump. Um, so you could see it in its original form. But over here, you've got a second one looking over no man's land towards the German line along that hedge. I'll come back to that. The training really works. The Germans do try and recover themselves. They get a machine gun back onto the into the, into no man's land. Uh, that's from its position into, into one of the craters. That's from uh, them. But the Australians deal with them. They deal with a lot of fixed positions with these concrete bunkers, that sort of thing. And they fight across a landscape that looks like that. It's poisonous, mangled porridge with overturned pillboxes and huge mine craters in it. And they work in combined operations with aircraft and tanks for the, for the first time. And bizarrely, they win. Um, that position on the lip of the crater, what you could see there, apart from being able to see this fantastic commanding view, is that they deepened and improved on that original single sheet of Wrigley tin crawl sap. So the ones that they need, the Germans don't counterattack, that's all good, the pioneers then go in and they start deepening and strengthening, because they know at some point they will come and try and recapture really the ground. Um, so training not only in living in those trenches, fighting, blowing the mine, capturing the crater, fortifying it, but also, as I keep saying, maintaining, improving, deepening. Um, to hold the ground. So that's been a bit of a counter through. But I want to bring you back to this, to the move forward in 1918 uh, by some New Zealanders who were just north of our boys at Blue Street at Messine. Because they were trained as blockishly as were Wellington's men in 1815. Haig's men in 1918. And Wellington's men in 1815 both did the same thing. Despite being blockish and trained, they beat what everybody else considered to be the best army in the world at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, North Midlands Division, so just over the border, back into England. Um, but North Midlands Division having, having captured and broken the Hindenburg Line at the Labasse Canal. Um, if you have uh, Ian from um, Staffordshire County Council giving this presentation, he says, that's, that's what the training at Cannock Chase did, because all those boys in North Midlands Division, they train, they train at Cannock. Um, they, they crack the Hindenburg Line and defeat the German army in the field. In two minutes to finish, nice example from RAF Halton, but in part are being rebuilt. These are the young RAF recruits. Between their first phase training and their second phase, there's usually a bit of sitting about. And uh, some of the people at Holton have got them rebuilding a part of their trenches to get them fit, get them working together, build unit cohesion, teach them about the history of where they came from. Oh yeah, all those things that were in my original list. And actually, occasionally, RAF regiments still use trenches, so it's all good stuff. And when I stood and listened to them, all the banter about, oh look, our firebase is better than yours, you're going to have to rebuild yours, it's not the right angle. I thought, apart from there being girls there in different uniforms, I close my eyes, it's 1915 again. It's absolutely brilliant. And that's what they've done. And, and this is visitable uh, by appointment. Um, absolutely beautiful. And they're now building an indoor set as well, uh, so that you can uh, do things in those without it being quite so dangerous as being outdoors in inclement weather for, for schools groups. So, there we are. Uh, look, Great War training helps us understand what's going on in the landscape <coughs> here and in France and Belgium, and indeed uh, on the Austrian front, although they're working on granite on a battlefield like that. Um, the training camps are 
a critical, crucial part of the narrative. They recontextualise the boys who are following up on that one to you and there. And they really are part of the, the memorial landscape here because people who haven't got time, money, whatever, to go to Belgium, see trenches, they come and see yours. And there is much part of the battlefield and the, and the military lands, the conflict landscape, as anything that you can go and see by getting on Eurostar. And to finish, there always ought to be a punch cartoon. War Office Genius. Now this is another of my brilliant ideas. The shelter trench exercise. I know the trench is the wrong way around, uh, but when they're finished, uh, they're firing them into the wood, and then they turn around and charge away from the wood. But I get a capital bank and ditch around my plantation with no expense. Um, this is just pre-war. It's from a pre-1914 punch cartoon. But um, it, it really does, it brings us back to that idea of, if you ask people about Great War training, they probably think it's, you know, it, it's effectively another Lord Melchick character. Um, and um, actually, no, there was really rather more going on. It was much, much better than that. There's some weird, weird, weird bits of things that went on in the war at, uh, on the edge of Salisbury Plain. Um, but it matters. Uh, it, it, they were trained. They were trained quite well for what they were doing once people were playing catch up. Um, and I'm pleased to say uh, that I've just been commissioned to uh, write the Historic England thematic on um, field works in England. So if any of you, so I'll be using yours as one of the international comparators, um, I'm pleased to say. Uh, but if any of you have any good examples from the other side of the border, uh, I'd love to hear from you about that as well. So thank you very much. We won't take questions just now, we're going to have this paper and then we'll have a short uh, comfort break uh, and then another paper and then we'll sort of, uh, take questions for all of the three morning papers uh, after that. So, right, well, you might be wondering why somebody from English heritage or historic England as we are now has come to talk about something in Wales. Well, I'm going to give you a broader brush rather than just what's in Wales, but the principles of what I'm discussing applies throughout all the training trenches that we're going to look at. Um, I am actually, as you may tell from my absence, I do come from Wales, um, but I've been, uh, well, shall we say, uh, seconded into England for some time now. Um, but I do sit on the Welsh Conflict Archaeology Advisory Panel. Um, we meet about three times a year and discuss policy in Wales as to how we can progress such work. Right, um, to start with, trenches. How long have they been used? How, you know, are they a new phenomenon? Well, in actual fact, no, they're not. Trenches were used by the Romans. Trenches were used throughout the medieval period. And once you come into the period when artillery is available, trenches really are the only way you can safely approach an enemy's position. And that's what trenches were used for. They weren't really used for fighting from. They were means of access and also means of getting to a point where you can tunnel under the enemy's defences. And all engineers were taught how to dig saps. Now that drawing there is as valid today in an engineering manual as it was back in the 18th century. They're virtually diff no difference, except the uniforms have changed in the drawings. I can actually produce them, but I'm not going just not got the time. The British Army had been building trench works and field works from the year dot. And probably the nearest point in time really where defensive systems as a field work were considered as better than having formal fortifications was at the time of the Peninsula War. And here we see earthworks stuck, actually by Portuguese men, for the British Army as part of the lines of Torres Vedra. There were three lines of defence, all using revetments, uh, redoubts, gun positions, and a covered way. A covered way is really a bank trench with a pathway behind where you're protected by the bank. 
And that ran the full length of all the lines that are to Torres Vedra. Probably the last time this method of fighting was used was the Siege of Antwerp uh, the, in the first half of the 19th century. And you see trenches. And what you do is you drink, dig a parallel and then you dig the sap out. It's zigzagged so nobody can fire straight down the line of it. Enfilade fire. And you approach, then you dig your second parallel, you approach and then dig your third, and from that is where you operate <coughs> against the enemy defences. But, as Martin said earlier on, the Russia Japanese War at the beginning of the 20th century was a turning point. And there's a number of reasons why it was a turning point and why trenches gained a new role. Yes, they were trying to creep forward to fortify positions. The Japanese were the ones who were chiefly using the trenches and they were digging towards the Russian fortifications. As you can see, the ground is pretty dry and fairly solid. There's no revetting whatsoever to hold it up. But the trenches are quite wide, but you could fire a shot down there and kill I don't know how many men in one go. So technically they haven't really understood, but they proved very, very successful. Now this is the first occasion the British started using trenches, and it's for exactly the same reason as the Japanese. This is the Boer War, and you suddenly find you get khaki uniforms instead of bright coloured uniforms. Men use cover like this. They make little small pits to lie in and put the spoil in front of them. That was all textbook training. They were trained to do that before they ever got there. Why the change? It's the weapons they're using. So why have you got to do this? You've got to find some protection from those new weapons. And you have quite shallow trenches to begin with, and you also build these at redoubts, which command an area, and you have shelters within them to protect the men from return fire. The reason being is the introduction of rifles like the Lee Enfield, the Mauser. They could fire higher velocity bullets very accurately over a considerable range and quite rapidly. The rate of fire being put down by that time was so great and so accurate, any man who stood up was pretty suicidal. You, so you've got to start finding ways of protection and the trench is where this comes in. Not only have you got rifles being introduced, rate of fire. Now here we see Richard sat at the machine gun. I'm sure it's Richard. I don't know how he's travelled in time. <laughs> but that gun can fire between 450 and 500 rounds a minute. If you have a number of machine guns firing onto the same ground, you're not going to stand much chance to survive. You've got to dig down to protect yourself. Not only that, artillery. Now, in the 19th, 18th and 19th century, you have what was known as case shot and shrapnel. Shrapnel coming towards the uh, 19th century. Case shot, basically it's lots of balls or rubbish fired down the gun, spreading out in a cone to cause mayhem when they hit anybody. But by the time these photographs were taken on the turn of the 20th century, these are 15 pounder quick firers, quick firing being important. It means you can fire a gun, that gun, about 12 times a minute. Each time you fire it, you're firing a round which holds 500 lead balls. The killing power is increased dramatically. Here you see a shrapnel, round in section. All those balls fly out. I have actually put some shrapnel balls in there. Everybody dig these up and say, oh, look at that, must be a ball. Forget it, they're not. They're shrapnel rounds. And the killing power is immense because the shrapnel was designed to use a fuse. So it didn't burst in the ground, it burst overhead. And if you have accurate range finding, and a little officer who could do his mathematical collections, he could work out exactly when the shell needed to detonate. High explosive shells start coming in. Originally, black powder was the only explosive available. That is a low explosive. Oops, a few books gone the <laughs> The low explosive has only limited power. You bend your shell into the ground, it goes bang, it makes a small crater, throws out lots of salts and little bits of fragments which don't travel very far. You fill a six-inch shell full of high explosives like lidite, amatol, or TNT, 
<coughs> everything within 70 feet of that shell landing is going to be damaged in one way or another. The closer you are into it, the less likely you're going to be in any sense or any ability to survive it. So there's your forms of artillery attack. And you have a trench. Now a trench is fairly narrow, it's a hard target to spot. Getting that shell to burst directly over the trench is a bit of a challenge. So, immediately you are upping the door survival rate by being in a trench. Now, Martin was saying about learning quick and things being taught. This is the 1908 manual for training engineers and infantrymen in how to build trenches, etc. So this is the response to the Boer War and to the Russian Sino War. Sorry, the yeah, Russian time. As you can see, you've got early forms of trench. You've also got these lying down positions where you're firing obliquely through the embrasures. So there's only a very narrow slot where you're actually at risk of being hit from. If you go up onto the uh, training area at um, Trasvillis, you will find these things up there. You will also find um, various lagers, which I'll come back to. These are also an indication of this whole point of stalling the enemy approaching you. Years ago, they used a batis. A batis are trees turned the wrong way round, wedged into the ground to form an obstacle. But barbed wire comes in. What a wonderful material for a defender. Pain for anybody who wants to attack. But these are actually <coughs> fairly typical of what was put up in the First World War, except as the First World War progressed, barbed wire entanglements got progressively more and more complex. Right, Sangers. Sangers were a feature of both the, um, the wars in Afghanistan and in South Africa. And again, you start getting Sangers being built up at Transvenis. You wouldn't think a bit of South Africa was up in Transvenis. It is. We were learning all the time. Don't ever think British troops were going to the front <coughs> untrained. They were not. We start digging trenches. They're fairly rudimentary. Quite small, not particularly deep. This is on uh, a point where you've got command. So you can fire down the slope. So anybody attacking is firing up. So they actually seem very little of you. So you can be fairly open. But, again, no, there is a traverse, but the gap between is not great. So they're still learning. If you're in wet ground, or in soft ground, or in sand, you've got to revet your trench, otherwise the moment it goes up, it slumps back down again. And you get various forms of revetting, and this is the earliest, <coughs> and they still apply now. But there was other techniques that came along during the First World War. Redoubts got progressively more complex. Bigger, deeper, greater capacity, a harder target to overcome. But it's still a field work. But as you see, they still haven't quite grasped the idea of having lots of space. If you've got lots of space, there's room for a shell or cartridges or fragments to go down the line. See, it gradually gets smaller. You also have to protect your artillery so that the artillery is part of the trench system. You have them just behind your lines. Obviously the range of the gun depends on where it's placed. Heavy artillery is going to be a long way behind, but the field artillery is going to be quite close up in the field behind your trenches. The Boer War also saw something else come of age. Iron blockhouses, what would eventually become known as sangers or pillboxes. So their first application really was during the South African Wars. But what do you find? <coughs> Fire trench in front for our infantry in the open, barbed wire entanglements, and then you have a bit of height by having your sign. That's your advantage, height. Because if you're higher up than somebody who's crawling towards you and firing at you, you can find out. Houses were built throughout the British Isles in the First World War. Don't think we were only trained. We were defending. And here we see you will have corrugated zinc on the timber frame filled with shingle. You can see the structure. And where is it? At the entrance to the side of the tunnel. With barbed wire entanglement. 
Most strategic sites during the First World War in Britain were defended. If we try and find that now, most people wouldn't see it at all. A good and well-trained archaeologist would say, hang on, there's some pebbles in the ground here. And then ask the question. And that's the point. It's having the eye to see that there's a difference and learning that you don't just go ploughing through everything. That could be found if you know what you're looking for. Right, come the First World War, <coughs> again, as Martin suggested, when the Kitchener put out his request for people to join the colour, they joined so rapidly, industry lost skilled men, the volume of men was so great we didn't know where they earth to put them on, or how to deal with them. In Sheffield, there was no camp to put them in, so the men stayed at home. But they went to the local football ground to train initially, so back to where training grounds are, football grounds are a fair bet. These are the Leeds pals. Note, no uniforms, they wasn't enough to go around. Rifles are the Enfields, but it's the long the Enfield which wasn't the standard issue, it wasn't what they'd gone to war with. And here we are, actively training how to attack something. It's close to Dale's site, so I'll come back to later on. There's a little earthwork there, which was probably some form of machine gun pit. Note that tree. That tree is significant, because in the next photograph, there it is, it's still there. Here's the hill they were going up, the fence line was there, which they were going over, and here's the trenches they were attacking. Who took the trenches? Well, this bunch of navvies aren't navvies at all. Those are soldiers of police. Pals. You wouldn't be able to tell they were soldiers in that photograph, but I can assure you they are. The hut behind them is a standard 60 foot uh, by 18 foot timber hut, clad in basically roofing felt. But they are soldiers. Now, so are these. Now they're in uniforms, but they're not the uniform you'd expect at the First World War. They are typical of Kitchener's volunteers. But if you look at them, they're all incredibly young. Back to the point Martin's making, these are boys coming straight out of college. And they were chiefly college boys all white collar workers, <coughs> never done a labouring job in their lives. Suddenly they're told to dig trenches. And it's total mayhem. Look at them, they're so close together, how can you dig a trench? It's a nonsense. So, come along, pick and shovel drill. You are taught how to dig a trench. And you're taught on a training ground. And you have to be two paces from your nearest map. Because when you swing a pick, well, swing your shovel, you're not hitting them. <coughs> so there's the tools of the trade. Standard issue, <coughs> and that's what all infantry men would have had to learn how to use. Now I'm sure there were a fair few blisters with the white collar men joining up when they had to start digging. But back to collectors of uh, military, but many don't think of those as military issues. Look on the headstocks, it's the Tempest original, there we mark. So there's your trench. Very simple to begin with. Fire step, solar trench, parapet. Note how the parapet is thicker. Reason being, it's got to stop a bullet coming through. You have a paradox. Why do you have a paradox? Well, artillery comes from burst behind you, so again that catches fragments, but also when you're on that fire step, it reduces your silhouette when you're firing on the top. In actual fact, in the end, the paradox got a lot higher. So the whole idea <coughs> was we were never silhouetted against the skyline. But all this is in stages, and this is very early in the war, this particular design of trench, back to things change. That is a practice trench. No way would you actually go to war in a trench like that. That is what's termed a first stage trench. That's Marlborough Down in Wiltshire. Again, these men are all with the long Lien fields, so they're not actually overseas. You can tell that immediately. That trench has been there for quite a while because there's a lot of growth on it. So it's been used repeatedly. But it hasn't developed any further. However, here's a site where the first trench, first stage trench, is still there. 
but they've built a new nice fire trench in front of it, and they've even got saps going out into no man's land. Then behind it, you've got this communication trench going back to a redoubt. So that's the fallback position if everything falls apart. So you're learning how to use a whole trench system. Eventually, they get much more complex, as Martin showed. You have three lines of trenches. Now, that would be known as the observation trench or command trench, and that would be the fire trench in this arrangement. But eventually, when you've got multiple trenches, you have the command will be back at the redoubt. You then have a reserve trench, a support trench, and then a fire trench. That, by the way, was it switch. Trace of a trench. Whatever type of wriggle it is, is called a trace. And there is quite a wide variety. And again, all soldiers were taught them. Now, how many actually dug them, get back to the point, once they've been dug once, it's a matter of maintaining, not having to dig again. But the theory has got to be done. What does a trench constitute? Well, if you're in rocky ground, you're not going to dig very far down. Too much effort. So all you're going to do is dig a low, a low trench and pile up the spoil. As in this example, with a trench mortar being used, this is a bit of a pose photograph because it's an officer firing it. <laughs> Think of what you're looking at. Don't believe immediately what you see is a real photograph. <clears throat> There's the other problem, wet ground. A lawful lot of the British trenches in Belgium were not trenches at all. They were breastworks. And some were enormous. The ground was so saturated it would have just flooded immediately. Some of them actually went straight up from ground level, didn't even have this little bit of a trench. So you build your breastwork. So trenches are actually three-dimensional upwards as well as three-dimensional downwards. Um, there's examples of, of breastworks on the Redmost training site up near Sheffield. And I had somebody tell me, well, why have they built them in negative? Well, that's why. Right, so as war went on, extemporization became much more a factor. So all those nice neat drawings of how to revet your trench in that earlier manual wasn't practical. So you then resort to much simpler methods. Expanded metal, I'll show you some pictures of some in a minute. Look, made from cement casks. Your cement came in a wooden cask. So you use the staves to make revetting or you make rough hurdles put them in and they lean against the tap. You fix them in by different ways. Wires, anchor points, poles, you name it. All manner of ways of doing it. Pickets, steel pickets are driven in the ground. All that remains in the ground is archaeological evidence. Now this is the picture which keeps on cropping up. It is actually my photograph. I wasn't old enough to take it, mind you. Um, this is Penali. There's Tenby in the background. And they're using hurdles as revetting. It's a wonderful photograph because there's all these men standing there in a variety of dress. There's a regiment from Barnsley, there's Royal Engineers, and there's some senior officers in the background. <coughs> so I want to say this is probably when they were actually having a break rather than actually anything else because it's not a really posed photograph as you expect, particularly when you start looking at some of the things the men are doing in the background. But it's a good example of what training was. Because this is just training. You're digging a trench. This is what you've got to learn the skills to do. So what do you find in trenches? Well, it's not just the trench itself. You have machine gun emplacements cut into the lip of the trench, where you have a little space in there for number two who's feeding you the ammunition. That acts as a table to set up your tripod on. Now that one there, shell hole. How to, even in a small shell though, but it even gives you how long it should take. One man, one pick and shovel, two hours. To make that an operable site. There's, don't forget there's a fire as well. <coughs> but, you know, so it's not just the trench, it's the craters as well. <coughs> Shelters. They could be timber framed with earth piled over the top. They could be metal, very much like the Anderson shelter, basically, the little elephant shelters. Put <coughs> back into the ground. If somebody's going over a trench complex with uh, geophys, they're going to certainly see concentrations of metal. And that's probably what they're picking up, is features like that. Deep shelters. 
And Martin alluded to the one you know, down in Dorset where uh, Dorset, Dorset. Yeah. Yeah, Dorset, where the car park started collapsing. We don't know how many deep shelters were dug on this side of the channel. It's something which really people haven't followed up on. There is even a suspicion of one possibly being here, because there is certainly a tunnel here, but nobody's been able to work out what the tunnel was for. Um, these are about 50, 60 feet down in the ground. And this is where the men would stay when it was a heavy bombardment. And they would only emerge once the bombardment passed. This is later in the war. At the beginning of the war, these things weren't built. They hadn't sustained or been in trenches in a heavy bombardment. This is lesson learned, so it's a continual process. And of course, the trains. Human you know, activity means you've got to go to the loo. How many latrines were dug? Where were the latrines? Were they in the front line? Were they in the reserve lines? Were they in the community trenches? They're all things that need to be looked for. And when you look into a trench, you get recesses. And it's a story of small arms ammunition, or grenades, mills bombs. So you get all manner of features in the trench trenches. Wire. Wire is a massive thing. You talk to any, well, you say you can't any longer, but talk to, I've talked to soldiers from the First World War, and they, in the early memories, some of them, was just having to go into no man's land and repair the wire all the time. And it was heavy, heavy work, in darkness, sliding around in mud. Not great fun. But the manuals tell you even how to loop the wire to make sure it stays on the pickets. Everything is trained. And who dug these trenches? Not very military looking, is it? Back to what we were saying about schoolboys. These are public schoolboys. This is Shrewsbury School. And virtually every public school in this country had its own little um, unit which taught basic military skills. And when you look at the officer corps of the British Army, virtually all of them came from public school. And this is where they started. Where were all these training sites? Well, all over the place. In the most ridiculous of places you can imagine. There was even one up in the middle of the wilds near Tra uh, Devil's Bridge. This is one at Rosebush in the Priscelli Hills. Virtually every site will have some trench works of some description. They're all over the place. It's knowing where they were and recognizing the features on the ground. Not quite sure what that lady in the child thinks of these soldiers marching by. Scotson Camp, big Victorian <coughs> fort, disused, camp built outside it. Um, Welsh Regiment, and they manned real trenches to defend them for Haven as training. They also trained on machine guns. <laughs> wooden machine guns, I might add. They don't believe they fired wooden bullets, <laughs> but at levels you've got some <coughs> synthetic training. That's taken at Scotland Fort. Right, so what's a training trench like? Well, this is how most people envisage a training trench. Nice and clean, absolutely perfect. But in actual fact, this is only part of a grenade school. And if you look at this little chap down here, he has actually got a stick grenade and he's showing how to throw it. But the trench is a, basically a training trench. There's nothing else. And it's perfect. But there you are, there's one of those little recesses for taking ammunition. You also get them for telephones, you name it, all manner of things. That is also a training trench. But that is much more likely what they would have been encountering once they got the other side of the channel. That degree of churning up. And they have to learn how to deal with it. Back to living in a trench, learning how to fight in it. This is actually on the edge of Salisbury Plain. I don't know actually exactly where it is. So it's one for you to run, hunt out. Yeah. <laughs> XPM, expanded uh, metal. Uh, perforated metal, that's what I was talking about earlier on. It's metal sheets which have little slits because it, and when you pull it, it stretches and forms these little holes. But it's used for uh, reinforcing in concrete, but it proved ideal as a revetment for trenches. Now, looking at the state of that trench, would you say that's a real trench or a practice trench? Anybody? Real. Well, it isn't a real trench. <laughs> 
It's real in the sense of it's everything a trench should be, except it's a little bit shallow. And you've got men here with a grenade catapult called a leech. But look at these men. They're standing on the parapet with their heads way up above. If that was a real sight, they'd have been mowed down by now. So it's, again, it's this, this idea of looking at a photograph, same here. Now this is showing how, demonstrating how to use rifle grenades. Now there's been lots of well, rifle parts of rifle graves found in the dig here. This gentleman and this one is actually doing it properly. He's got the butt tight against the back wall of the trench. This one over here, if he did it, he'd have been knocked backwards. So again, how much is this a posed photograph? They probably did find them afterwards because you've got all this lot standing with their hands in their pockets watching. So again, it's a nice training photograph, but it shows what was dug. Training men how to fight. This is an example in a manual of how you fight as a grenade party. You have the enemy trench. You come along it lengthwise. You have two men with bayonets up front with a rifle. Then you have the thrower with the grenades. You have a carrier with a bag full of grenades. And then you have the officer instructing them. There they are. There's the two. It's just out the picture there, the top of his cap. There's the two men with the bayonets, except that's a wooden gun. So again, it's a training shot. Nice, slippery, <coughs> well-worn trench. There's your thrower, there's your carrier, and there's your officer behind. It's training. But if you saw that photograph without any sort of thought, it'd be very easy to say that it was a, a real photograph taken to the wall. Again, you've got expanded metal there as a revetment. Gas training. Who actually built uh, gas chambers? Generally, they were one of these little um, shelters built into the side of a trench, and then you had a gas curtain put on it. The idea of a gas curtain that is normally actually to keep the gas out. But in this case, you'd have locked the gas grenade inside, put the men in, and kept the, kept the thing there down to ensure the gas stayed in. Now, this photograph actually is Second World War, but the principle is exactly the same in the First World War. So, again, gas training will have occurred at these trenches. It was normally tear gas, it wasn't active grass, but I've been in a room filled with tear gas and I can tell you it's pretty unpleasant. Right, assault training. This is the back door training area down um, near Eastbourne. Wonderful site. Loads and loads of trenches in all directions. This is the Canadian Army training and a small mine that's just been detonated. Leaving a crater. Back to what Martin was saying about defending it. This is how you defend your crater. You get into the lip, you dig your trenches and defences as fast as you can before the Germans get there. Because look how much height it gives you. That height is important. 15 feet is what they're suggesting there. And there's a mine in fact, it's the same mine that was in the previous photograph taken from the opposite view. And look, there's the firing presences, uh, positions put into the, into the uh, spoil from the mine going off. On a smaller scale, you also link up trenches. Uh, sorry, not trenches, big bug craters on a small scale and defend craters. These are actually quite large craters because they're allowing three firing positions rather than one. But this is a standard technique. You even put shelters into them. So you've always got somebody out in no man's land ahead of your main defences who can enfilade back to this whole point of firing at the side of whoever's attacking the flank. You kill more people firing from the side than firing straight on. So if you can get a little bit further out and then fire sideways, you're actually achieving a much greater effect. Uh, now this shot is the London defences. This is Waldingham, and again, those men are those officers who are being trained, digging the trenches around London. But look at the scale of it. It's a massive feature. And those trenches went right around London. We defended quite heavily in the, in the First World War. People think it was all the other side channel. No, it wasn't. Beach defences at Felixstowe, the little small blockhouse, but note, the blockhouse doesn't fire outwards in the direction the enemy's coming from. 
it's firing the enfil lead on either side once they get held up by the wire. And that's exactly what those traitors are for. Real defences. This is a trench map for the defences of the Royal Dock at Pembroke Dock. And it actually shows where my father's farm was in the First World War. All the features in red had already been completed by the time the map was drawn. The features in green were under construction. Those guns, artillery pieces I showed you earlier on, 15 pounders, emplacements for 15 pounders, right in amongst the trench systems. But it's not a continuous trench system. It's using defending localities on the landscape. Blockhouses, those are actually defending the railway line. All the features <coughs> are in those uh, handbooks, are in these things. On top of that, they're actually cutting hedges down to increase fields of fire. Now, if you go back to this site today, what you find is where the hedges are taken down, you get um, deer park fencing. So when you travel up and down the country and you find some deer park fencing at a road junction which has got no sense whatsoever, I'll virtually guarantee it was a site where the hedge was cleared for defending that junction, that piece of road or wherever. Coastal defence. Trenches, this is down on Portland Island, Rufus Castle. And these maps are fascinating because they actually tell you the cost of doing the work. <laughs> and that goes right around the whole of Weymouth, like that. Now obviously everybody thinks of this as being the reality of the First World War, but I hope we've been showing you that there was another reality. German trenches, oh, vastly dissimilar from ours, but note the name. And I think this is lovely, shrapnel away. <laughs> and that element of humour applies to virtually all the trench names. They were either familiar <laughs> face names or there was an element of humour in them. And every trench was named because when you brought up men from the rear, they had to know which trench they should be going there. And at the, out, at the uh, outset of the song, there was massive confusion. And men were held in the communication trenches because they didn't know where they were supposed to be going. And they got shelled there. And there were a lot of the casualties at the beginning of the song, really ever, ever before they went over the parapet. However, back to uh, the picture from the Ar Australian Archive. You can see the names. Safety Alley, Queer Street. Stanway Avenue, Combe Avenue, the Haymarket, Oxford Circus, Regent Street, Bond Street. All those applied to trenches uh, everywhere else. And in training, the trenches got named. Um, I'm afraid it looks a bit pale on here, so the projection of it, but this is my personal favourite set of trenches. This is Penali down in South Wales. The deepest point of that trench is five feet, and that's allowed for something. So it's virtually as was. But if you see the first stage trenches, then you see the elaboration of how it grows the complex. You've also got a little redoubt there, you've got a redoubt here. But it, remarkably, you can't see very clearly in sort of, There is another one there. That was missed when this area was surveyed. And further trenches went either side of it. The soldiers who trained in those trenches were fired over by artillery. They weren't just uh, in their learning, they were getting inoculation. That won't be much longer. Complex training areas. This is the Red, Red Myers training area just outside of Sheffield. You can look very carefully at this photograph, and the more you look at it, the more trenches you see. There is not a part of that photograph below that streamline that hasn't got trenches. And all those trenches are superimposed over time. They weren't all dug at one time. And they reflect learning from the front, how you actually lengthen your fire bays or shorten your fire bays, how you widen the width or narrow it. It's all there on the ground. The earliest trenches are over here, and the further you go that way, the later the trenches are. That's only the central area of it. And back to uh, things like grenade training, that trench there is a grenade trench, and there's a magazine on one end of it and a training platform on the other. And it's throwing, allowing you to throw down into this training area over here, where trenches have been dug previously. There are more trenches on either side, almost equal areas. There's 74 hectares of trenches. Massive area. But that's what it looks like on the ground. You've got to take quite a leaf of imagination to realise you're dealing with trenches. They're much clearer here. 
Sometimes they're invisible because they're underneath heather growth. I'm afraid you probably can't see this very clearly, but in each of those rings there are trenches. This is Burbage Edge in Derbyshire, and these LIDAR images were taken by the coal board. But what they've shown is not necessarily substance, but trench systems. Um, this is Chiffledon in, in Wiltshire, not far from Swindon. Massive complex of tren trenches dug. That section there is just that part there. This has all been plotted from aerial photographs. But if you go on Google Earth, you can see these trenches quite clearly as prop marks. And this is not a million miles away from here. This is Old Oswald Street, Hill Fort at Oswald Street. There are actually three lines of trenches, although in this particular shot it's only looking at two of them. They're quite well preserved, although the deepest of those is only six inches. You've got to have a real eye to spot them when you're on the ground. But we've got a problem of education. Back to people thinking whether this is archaeology or not. Read that. That's the English Heritage Information Panel. Hmm. Hardly satisfactory, is it? The pact of archaeology is continually progressing. <coughs> Everything is superimposed upon it. It doesn't stop at a point in time. And the Iron Age certainly wasn't the point at which it stopped. Thankfully, modern military archaeology is now being part taught to <coughs> archaeologists. This is uh, York University's dig at Breary Barracks. Um, they've been digging both the camp and shortly they'll be looking at the trench system as well. Right, well that's a, a very quick whistle stop. I mean, I could elaborate on every single section of it, believe it or not. <laughs> um, but I've slipped this one in. Don't forget, a lot of the soldiers who fought in the 38th Division could only speak Welsh. You had to recruit in Welsh. You had a non-conformist uh, attitude where you shouldn't have been fighting. So there was a lot of emphasis on encouraging Welsh men to join up. And there were some of them we're playing on nationalism. I haven't put them in, I just haven't got the time, but this is a nice one. Uh, come on my boys, enlist today. Now that's one of the, the mildest ones, I would come up with much stronger <laughs> ones than that. But anyway, well, thank you very much. There's lots of things here which uh, we can walk along, we need to have a look at, so if you haven't already looked at them, do please have a look. There's a Lee Enfield on the top here, if you want to handle it, have a word with me later on, I'll show you how it's done. Okay, well thank you very much. <laughs>